did a presentation to our treaty group, and, and essentially he talks about the um, Algonquins of Ontario. He talks about the uh, different Métis groups, um, you know, from the MNO to these other ones. And he basically talks about what their claims are, their indigeneity of, uh, of, their, of their groups, right? He kind of debunks a lot of, you know, these claims of, of being indigenous uh, through, through research. Oh, okay. And with the AOO, there's a mixture there. There's, there's um, uh, at the government and all their wisdom kind of, you know, uh, made, <laughs> made Indians out of these, these uh, you know, people who have claims, some of them which may be some of some relevance, some which are not, most of which are not, um, you know, dated back to the 1600s to, you know, a woman who, and I'm just giving you an example, a woman who, who was basically a Nipissing member. And so they're claiming that's their ancestry from the 1600s and, um, you know, that they're a First Nation, which is kind of ludicrous to, you know, if anything, if they have any claim, it would be to being a member of our community, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the most, I guess the most um, uh, problematic thing in this, this whole scenario with Métis and, and Algonquins of Ontario uh, that are dealing with, you know, the land claim settlement is that it's another nation who is, is basically sanctioning these people as indigenous when it should be. I mean, if there's anybody that should be recognizing, um, you know, indigenous ties to our communities, it should be us, not a provincial government. And, and that's where I have, you know, a lot of problems. I can't remember who it was who said, I think it was over at Mechrity who said something like, you know, the, the colonial government are so bold that they, they think they can make Indians uh, out of non-Indians and real Indians not, you know, <laughs> like they have that magical power to do that. And, you know, it, it's crazy that you have all these groups that are, you know, claiming to be. And, you know, when you think of it, you can claim to have indigenous heritage, but that doesn't make you a nation. That doesn't even make you part of a nation. Like the nation sh should be determining who their people are, right? And not a provincial government or a federal government for that matter, any foreign government. You know, it's like a nation, another nation, who their who citizens are. You know, it's like America telling Canada who's, who is a Canadian and who's not. Yeah, well, and take that analogy one step further. I, I got Ukrainian blood in me. That doesn't make me, you know, an Ukrainian citizen. Yeah. No, and it, it doesn't make you at war with Russia. No, and the same with my Irish heritage, my Scottish, my German, right? No, exactly. I can I can claim that as a heritage ancestry, uh, but that's as far as it goes. It's not a legal standing. One thing that we're working on at Nipissing, it's kind of tied into the Anishinaabeg Nation uh, Governance Agreement. We have now... Um, a piece of legislation that recognizes what we're doing and it has funding attached to it but we've been kind of moving in this direction for a long time and that's over the last year we have struck up a citizenship committee and essentially uh, the federal government doesn't want to touch it because they they understand how complicated it the indian act as much as you know it, it's it's a, it's a horrible act and it should be abolished but it has to be abolished in in steps and one of the things about it was it, it made it very simple with blood quantum, which makes you a status person or not, right? And then the whole status status card verification of identity. It was a very simple one. It's, it wasn't a, a right one or, or, or a great one, but it was very simplistic. But it wasn't fair and it wasn't uh, a, a, um, a system of self-determination. It was, it was imposed on us, but it was very simplistic. Mm -hmm. So to do it 
to do it properly, Canada didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole because first place, it wasn't theirs to touch. And second place, it's very complicated. So they <clears throat> took a piece of legislation and passed it over to us, which as much work as it's going to be and as complicated as it is, it's still our work to do, right? So we're in the process now. And last year, we've, uh, we've got a citizenship committee uh, struck and we've been meeting with the committee to go over, you know, citizenship. It's very complicated. And this can't, is not to be confused with status. It's who Nipissing people are, regardless of their status. And, you know, how are we going to determine who is a Nipissing First Nation member? And on the surface, it sounds fairly straightforward, but as you start to uh, delve into the, you know, the uh, the work, the, the nuts and bolts of, uh, of the work that has to be done, you see, you start to see very complicated scenarios, such as, uh, you know, non-Indigenous spouses, are they not, you know, or are they citizens, or are they not citizens, or are they a different class of citizens, uh, you know, what about uh, people who just live with us, among us? You know, there's different ways of trying to figure out how this is going to work. One of the things that we can all agree on is that, and we have to define these words like citizen, which is those who belong with us. Okay, but what, what does that really mean? Does it mean they, you know, if they're not Indigenous, they don't belong among us? Or they do, but they are only entitled to certain, you know, because we have to provide services for Deben Dodzawad. Who gets school funding? Who doesn't? Who gets health funding or health services? Or, you know, and who doesn't? Uh, you know, is it all the citizens? Who are we going to fight for to have tax exemption? You know, so it gets very complicated and really fast. We have to uh, sit down and, and figure all of this stuff out, right? And what happens in the case of a divorce? You know, uh, <laughs> do we still pick up somebody's garbage because they got divorced or and they're not a citizen anymore? Or like, how is it all going to work? And, and, and those are the things that I'm struggling with at the committee level. So what we've decided to do is kind of take this approach of a very high level approach to, at first before trying to put uh, you know, any meat on the bones, uh, just some core values and try and uh, build it up from there. So it's going to prove to be a very lengthy and a complex process with with some heavy consultation. we got to make sure we're bringing the community along and getting input all along the way. So it's very in its very infancy, but, um, you know, this is, I think, what's going to lead to probably adopting... Uh, a one-parent rule for the citizens who are actual Ising and Anishinaabeg, which means that, you know, they are the bloodlines of, of the Ising people, not necessarily married in or whatever. So the first step in also getting status for all of our members, it, it's no longer the 6-2, the 6-1 uh, blood quantum that makes some status or exempt from the taxes, but it would be our law that makes them exempt from any taxation. Yeah, well, that's where the rubber uh, really hits the road for a lot of people and probably also the Canadian government and provincial, right? The It comes down to dollars and cents and rights and responsibilities and services because everything's finite, right? You know, our uh, numbers of status members to our community, right? That's what that's how they gauge things. And, you know, if we go to a one-parent rule, that that's going to, in a very short term it's going to increase our membership but i think over the long term it's going to stabilize it because right now with the, with the blood quantum rule under the indian act projections are you know maybe 60 years of not having too many band members left i don't know if you've ever heard the expression of soft genocide but this is exactly what that is right it's legislating our people out of existence through indian act or whatever legislation that the government has put into place, and, and don't kid yourself to think that they weren't thinking of this, a timer on, on getting rid of the responsibilities uh, to Indigenous people, to have the legislation of what acknowledges you or identifies you as Indigenous to eventually fizzle out, right, where there won't be any identifiable Indigenous people, and therefore their judiciary responsibility would be negated through that piece of legislation. It doesn't have to be all blood and guts uh, genocide. It, it can be just lack of 
recognition through time and legislation. Yeah, what was it? Go to university, lose your status at one point? I have friends who are not status because their grandfather got killed in, in the war. He gave up his status to fight for Canada. He's, he got killed overseas, never came back, so he could never regain his status. Because they said, well, once you come back from the war, you can regain your status. He never did. So all his grandchildren children and grandchildren uh, lost their, their status. They're currently fighting to get it rectified, but it's not complete yet. 